Very excited to be here today. Lots of great energy from everybody, and we hope to continue that this second half um, when we have our panel. And Costanza will join us at the end. Um, so we'll have two presentations, and our first presentation is going to be by Patterson Sims, who's the president of the Leon Polk Smith Foundation and an independent art curator, writer, and consultant. Um, he's a distinguished career museum professional, including um, uh, stints at the, at the Montclair Art Museum, as well as the Waiting Museum of American Art and the Museum of Modern Art. Please help me welcome Patterson Sims. So we had a wonderful overview provided for us um, a little bit earlier. This is just a focus on one person on the art of the work of Leon Pope Smith. I was asked to do this. I didn't force this upon uh, everyone. Um, and I'm really happy to uh, be here to share a little bit more about Leon. Leon, who you can see here around 1946, was a, a very articulate, a very clear, uh, but a very cranky guy. And I'm always convinced I knew him in the last probably 10 years of his life. He was born in 1906 and died in 1906. Um, but he actually wore more than that for the last 15 years of his life. And he was always wonderful to me. He was really, really, I think, terrific with curators. He was really good with um, his uh, uh, fellow artists. The groups that he didn't do as well with, I think, were collectors and uh, galleries. And I guess if you have a choice in life and you're an artist, and maybe it's better to be close to that second two yeah. I mean, uh, groups rather than the first two necessarily, or to just meld them all together and be nice to everyone. Um, so here's Leon looking at you very intently, as he did in conversation, and um, in any, any way you were connected with him, and, and as I said, usually being quite charming with me, but he could be quite grumpy too. Um, beside him is a self-portrait from um, around the same time that the photograph was taken, actually a little bit later, 1954, the photograph comes probably from um, mid to late 40s. Um, and the, the portrait is quite wonderful because on one level, if I hadn't told you it was a self-portrait, you might have said, what a lovely abstraction, that began to form. He obviously was interested in the work of Rancuzzi, et cetera, et cetera. But then you really begin to see that it's Leon. It's just, just seen from an angle. And he portrayed himself a number of times um, during his creative life in these very abstracted ways. But I think it's kind of useful to think at the beginning of these remarks that this is the way he saw himself, that abstraction and the simplification of form was the way he saw reality. We've been thinking a lot about looking at reality and what reality might be and the role that color plays in that and the role that geometry plays in that whole process. That notion of radical simplicity, I think, is very key. Now, he wrote a lot, he was interviewed a lot. There's a very good website about his work, which the foundation that I'm involved with just has put together over the last year, and will continue to add to it. But as he says in this quote, on three elements which have interested me in art, art, line, color, um, and the concept of space, and it's, used as a, and it's used as a positive force. Again, I'd love you to keep that in mind as we look at some of these images. We'll be coasting through, I promise. Um, I'll be swift about all of this, because you've already looked at a lot of images. But um, we'll be coasting through his work just to get a sense of really what his sensibility was, what makes him distinctive, why his work um, might or might not engage us, but why it has the opportunity to engage us, because I think he had a very distinctive way of looking at form. In 1938, as he was just beginning his professional career, he made a whole series of figurative works. He had a, a period of his life when he went to Mexico. He must have been wild and crazy in Mexico, but he amazing, new, writhing forms. I mean, he must have had an incredibly good time. Um, and he also looked <laughs> behind him, as it, as it were, and really went for a rather more simple approach, um, as you see in this work. This is called A Stroll in the Forest. It's a wonderful early work, and it, it gets us excited the way early work can get you excited when you say, oh my gosh, I see, this, I see the seeds of everything that comes later in this work. He was looking at nature, he was simplifying nature, and he was turning it into these sort of marvelous totemic-like structures. It's sort of like uh, a Louise Bourgeois or something, um, though it was a little bit later, but that whole sense of simplifying natural form, really working with the organic, but turning the organic into something that was much more symbolic. Now clearly, at the core of almost any artist who is one wishing to work in a geometric fashion, um, at that point in the 30s and 
and into the 40s and certainly from the 20s on. At the core of that is obviously the really overwhelming figure of Mondrian. And here we see just two examples of Mondrian's work, a, a composition from 1921, uh, and then, of course, the work which we all know and um, have a strong bond with, I would suspect, Broadway Boogie Woogie from 1942, just at the very end of Mondrian's life, when he'd sort of ceased to be a Dutch artist, he moved to London, then he'd come to New York for the last four years of his life and made some of his most complex works. A lot of those works really play off of the city, and the notion of the urban grid, I think, is a very important um, sort of underlying factor in any appreciation of geometric abstraction, really the grid and the notion of, of a city and the way the city kind of constructs space is something that I think is enormously important for any number of the artists who work in this mode. But again, these Mondrian works are um, important to keep in mind for Leon's work, and they certainly were in his mind. They first emerge uh, basically in a, in a painting called White Woman, which is the work that's closest um, to me on the screen. And it's a work in which you can see this female form. It's rather like some of the shapes that he had in 1938 work kind of elongated, or not elongated, but they were an elongated version of something that ends up getting a head and a body below it, as you see in, in this form. And then behind it is this grid work. Um, and he felt this was the first time that he sort of had Mondrian enter his work. Um, but then once he entered, uh, there was no looking back. Uh, the 1940s were dominated for in his work by Mondrian-esque compositions, such as Expanse from 19... Um, 47, in which we see these red, black shapes. The other element that comes into play in these red shapes, as they sort of deal with Mondrian in a highly personalized way, in other words, neither one of these works would you say one of those are Mondrian's. He's just simply copied Mondrian's work. He's clearly looked at Mondrian's work in a very deep way, but he's found his own way. And one of the, one of the motifs that kind of evolved from Mondrian-esque geometry was a branding motif. And he was fascinated by branding these. He came from Oklahoma. He came from Oklahoma even before Oklahoma was Oklahoma. It was six years after he was born that it actually became a state. And he was born of Cherokee descent parents. So he had a lot of Native Americans sort of drifting through his family in different ways. Um, so there's a lot of intermarriage of his family um, with Native Americans. And he was very proud of his Native American heritage. And he, it worked into his paintings in different kinds of ways, so that people, A, that worked in on a conscious level, but then because people know that he was a Native American in his past, they often will see Native American motifs in his work. So if there's a triangle, they'll think it's a teepee. And it may be a teepee, but at the same time, it isn't necessarily a teepee. It isn't there simply because it's a teepee. That's one of the elements that he's sort of playing off of in his work. But as we keep moving, we see other examples of that, a simpler version, red, white, and or blue, blue, red, and white from 1946, and again, this sort of branding motif, the notion of it being the kind of brand that would be burned into the, to the, to the uh, skin of, of cattle to identify whose cattle was whose. And then another much smaller work, so I, I made it very tiny. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just 10 inches by 10 inches, but it's an example of, of the way that he, of course, showed his liberation from Mondria in the most powerful way, which, of course, was the introduction of a curve, or a circle. Mondrian always famously said that curves and circles were too emotional. So the emotional yeah. worked its way into, um, into Leon Paul Smith's work very, very quickly in the, in the 1940s. So by the mid-1940s, he was making Mondrian-esque paintings, but he was really using the circle. He could contain his rectangles within a circle. And making very exquisite works. I, as I've been going over his work over the last few years and sorting out his works on paper, we were happy, we were very lucky to find a number of unstretched canvases which were cut right to the end of the canvas, which were very similar to this floating white work from 1946 that you see furthest from me. As I say, it's just 10 inches by 10 inches, so its scale is, is in some way suggested. Okay, so as I say, Mondrian is kind of what <coughs> carries him through a great deal of the 1940s. Center columns, uh, blue, uh, red, using kind of the colors, sort of the colors that are associated with America, along with, of course, yellow as well, um, in that work of primary colors. The oil and panel, which is closest to me, is accompanied by a work that he is sort of 
and, and, and uh, sort of uh, disguisedly involved with Mondrian where we caught homage to Victory Boogie Woogie number one, now in the Dallas Museum. It's a painting which is 42 by 37 inches. He's beginning to sort of grow the scale of his works to no doubt um, in the 50s, especially when this happens to be influenced by the scale of abstract expressionism, but at the same time to realize that he can go larger and be larger and create these incredibly complex forms. The other aspect of um, Leon Paul Smith's work, which is revealed by homage to Victory Boogie Woogie, is a whole series of what he called inch by inch paint, inch by inch paint square paintings. He would use a motif that was inch by inch, that's sort of like confetti thrown onto the surface of the work in an incredibly structured way. So it's this kind of exuberant, happy situation. And then there are these zones of neutrality with the, that are introduced by the white and the gray. It's sort of as if they're, the, they're almost resting points and the very active trip that one's, met, that one's eye makes across these works. And now, a work from 1950 where he's breaking with Mondrian and uh, makes a painting which is not huge in scale, it's just 26 by 46 inches, but it's, it's a kind of an extension of scale which, well, as I say, will begin to happen very dramatically in the 1950s in this work. I also kind of connect this work in a way with the work of Franz Klein and the sense of uh, sort of big gestures, the, the black and white gesture, the, the extension onto the edge of the, of the surface, which happens, I think, in some of the greatest of the Klein paintings, black and white paintings, it, the, the form goes right to the edge of the painting. It's usually three or four have gone to the edge. Sometimes when they're simply isolated in the, in the center of the composition, it doesn't have the dynamic of something that, whose energy has spread and has really moved um, into uh, the sort of the real world from the pictorial world. Now, the other person who is really critical for any consideration of the way he paints is Matisse. And that isn't so obvious in certain ways, but it became obvious to me as I began to go through his library. He had a very small library, relatively speaking, and going and cataloging it as I did over the last couple of years, and it wasn't, didn't take me two years to do it, I just did it kind of slowly, was I discovered what books were the most worn out. Um, and the books that were the most worn out were his Montreal catalogs and his Matisse catalogs. The first art book that he bought was in 1938 when he went uh, for the first time to Europe. And it was a Matisse catalog. And there it is with his name inscribed on it um, and the, the year that he bought it. And so you really can sense when Mondrian came into his work. Just kind of arbitrarily, I, I picked these two works, the, the famous Women with Turtles in the St. Louis Art Museum, a truly strange, enigmatic work with these marvelous bands of color in the back that kind of take the figures away and make it some kind of rock, though, even, um, but done in 1907. Um, and then alongside it, um, Memory of um, Oceana, one of the marvelous cutout paintings that he made at the end of his life, where quite physically unable to paint, he was able to uh, make these amazing color compositions by cutting large sheets of paper. That notion of the organic form and the organic form at the same time being very sort of non-objective um, is, I think, again, something to keep in mind as we look uh, at his work as it unfolds. And unfold it does in the 1950s. Um, and these are two examples of 1950s works. Yellow Edge from 1954, fairly small, 31 inches um, around, and Kaniwa from 1956. And, it's hard to know what that is, this the name of an island, but he liked to name his pictures. He was really against untitled. And so quite frequently, his pictures are named, I would say 90% of the time. And his long-term associate, a really interesting guy named Robert Jameson, Bob, who he met in 1952 and he became his life companion after that, and his slave and, and studio assistant as well. Um, he's still alive, and he's full of really wonderful stories. And, if anyone knew how cranky Leon was, um, Bob definitely did. Um, in any event, in, he um, made these paintings based on something that might not become innately clear to you, but it will, I think, when I reveal it to you, which was that he was looking through a sporting <coughs> goods publication, just for different kinds of sporting goods, and he saw, a, he saw different baseballs that were offered, and there were many of them, so he was fascinated because it no longer became a baseball, it became an abstraction. And so baseballs, basketballs, different balls became fascinating to him because they became a way that line was introduced within a circle. So that the hard edge line, and you'll notice this, this is the way basketballs are seen together or baseballs are seen together. So there's a whole series of tondos that emerge from that. A, the tondo is charged because it 
takes him away from the geometric abstraction of Mondrian, which, as I said, was such a heavy, heavy, heavy influence on so much of the art produced um, by so many artists in Europe, but definitely by artists in the United States, especially with his coming in 1940 to New York City. But these pictures are very typical of a whole series and a whole exploration of the way a circular surface it can have its circularity suggested and its dimensionality suggested as these lines go across it. Um, another one is, is called uh, Anuit from 1958. It's owned by the Museum of Modern Art and um, very, very seldom shown by MoMA. Um, it's larger in scale, 56 inches. And alongside it is the very subtle and, and beautiful, and I think you can make it shape out. It's sort of white against white, but it's these two nestled organic forms called yellow light sun from the end of the 1950s. And it's sort of as if he took those balls and he sort of pushed them and he sort of suppressed the air out of them and he flattened them in a way. You begin, you can see that form as a form which comes from the tondo, but then it's a tondo that is, in a sense, had some of the air taken out of it or dealt with it in a somewhat different way. Now, this whole ability for him to use these organic forms is really one of the sort of magical qualities of his work. Here's another work from the late 1950s called Expanse. Um, and again, these you know, pictures, the yellow-white picture that we just looked at, and then of course this now Expanse, they're works which um, were made at exactly the same moment with a very sort of a, a kind of familial resemblance to them, and you begin to see how he, he's distorted the circle and found complex ways to sort of take a circular shape and a curved shape and uh, render it you know, increasingly ambiguous effectively. Um, but again, it raises these black and white issues that were spoken of so eloquently this morning in terms of is black a color and how, how does black as a color function and what, what are the other particular dynamics and properties of black. Black and white were critical to, um, to Leon Polk Smith from the first brand new series and to the many, many, many works on paper that he made but they also feature the wonderful painting that's upstairs, um, which we'll get a look at in a slide form in just a second. And again, to keep moving, I wanted to go in a direction. This is not a work of his. Who can tell me who did this? Yeah, cool. yeah, the wonderful, wonderful artist, uh, Gertrude Goldschmidt, um, who was born in 1912-15. It's un unclear her birth date, but she died in 1994. And she, of course, was a great artist of everywhere in the world, but, but her, her basis was in Caracas. And in Caracas in 1962, um, Leon had his first out of the U.S. show. The first time that he was really recognized in a significant way internationally. It was a big deal for him, a big deal for his art. He was showing with very sophisticated uh, European emigre dealers in New York at the Gallery Chalette, and they were able to open up lots of different doors for him in a wonderful way. So he had a more international, which at that point meant South American and European, uh, sort of reach than many artists of his time did. He went down to uh, Caracas and he met Gecko, and they became really very close friends. One of the things that's going to be very exciting is through the foundation when we've given some money to the Archives of American Art where Leon's papers were given uh, upon his death, and all of them have been digitized, and they'll all go online and be available for the world, and the letters from Gecko are some of my favorite things that are in that material. And you really begin to appreciate the warmth that the two of them have. And really, just to kind of keep that track going, the other two artists that he knew very, very well were Carmen Herrera. Of course, he's Cuban, um, but has lived in New York um, since 1954. And uh, along with her, another artist named Fanny Sanon. Carmen and, and Fanny are artists that I've just gotten to know in the last maybe five or six years of my life. Um, and many people have gotten to know more about Carmen's work during that time. She's really gone from being a, a definite unknown, or underknown to be sure, uh, to somebody who has kind of captured people's attention and interest. Happily, she's still alive. Uh, she, can, she can appreciate um, what she does. And now she got to know each other. And the other sort of aspect of art history that is not often spoken of, but to me, it's the critical one, the history of the dresses. They lived two doors away from each other on 19th Street. I happen to live on 19th Street, too, so I can go visit her because she's right down the block. That's where Leon lived. Um, that's where Tony Bashara, who some of you may know who runs the theme, who was the chairman for many, many years of the Barrio Museum. That's where Tony lives, because Tony lives in Leon Paul Smith's old law that just by sheer coincidence, this painter 
um, got to sort of boom into this loft, and you can see why, because it's a very attractive loft from the 19, so circa 1950s onward, when Leon and Bob moved out around the corner to Union Square, this loft became available, and eventually Tony was there. And Tony is kind of the, maybe the adopted son of Carmen Herrera, and has been done enormous things to sort of make people realize the value of her work. I show you these two artists because, again, their work deals with some of the same issues that Leon's work deal dealt with. And they both had extremely close relationships with Leon. And Carmen goes, to, goes so far as to say that her work was deeply influenced by knowing Leon. And one of the things that I think is really interesting and something that's going to probably happen in your museum in Buenos Aires is we're really going to be able to examine these relationships between North American geometric artists and South American geometric artists. And I think we're going to come up with a lot of things that are really just as interesting as any of the so-called connections to Europe and, and, and the Americas. I think we're going to find out a, a, really a lot of interesting issues. I have a young friend who's a graduate student at the Institute of Fine Art in um, New York, and she was an assistant for us, an intern for us, working on the own Paul Smith material. And so I have suggested, suggested to her kind of casually, you should look into Carmen and Leon's relationship, and now she's writing a paper. So there's a group of younger scholars who I think are going to get very interested in these issues. And, and as I say, Fanny is a very, very close friend of Carmen's, and then she had also known, known Leon. And again, he was an older man who was incredibly solicitous and friendly with artists. And his work, of course, had something to teach them, but at the same time, his manner had something to teach them as well. Now, during the 1960s, her work became much more organic, um, much more, in a sense, idiosyncratic and personal in its abstraction. She made a series of works which she called correspondences, and you see an example of orange-green correspondence right next to me. Um, here, and then correspondence yellow-white from 1967. These are both, as I, I think, classic examples of his work, these wonderful, simple shapes, this extraordinary ability to, with great sophistication, to create his own special kinds of forms um, that you know, don't relate to really anything but his own way of seeing form, I would say, and his, his really interesting marriages of geometry and the organic. The next series of works which he embarked on at the end of the 60s were the Constellation. And this is his kind of masterpiece of the constellations. It's called Constellation 12 Circles. Um, it's eight and a half by 12 feet. It's a kind of overwhelming work. And one of the issues that I think we all should think about together is one reason I'm convinced that we all like this work is it's very upbeat. It's very cheerful. We're living in a terrible time. <laughs> and, and in certain ways, I think these works are incredibly resonant of a more optimistic, of a moment of exhilaration, of really fun times, high times, enjoyable times in a way, that um, really there's kind of like a beach ball in the air quality to these works, which really, in a sense, I think is part of their power. Their, part of their power is that they actually have a lot of joy. And of course, we've come to be suspicious of joy. Anyway, this is a particularly wonderful example of the Constellation series, of which you now see two more. One of the most austere, beautiful, elegant of the constellations, Edge of Sight 2, which is upstairs, um, and then alongside a constellation number seven, called, called constellation number seven, Six Ellipses, from 1973. Both these works come from that same year, 1973. One of the things that's really so beautiful and so subtle about the constellation is the edge, the paint, the, the edge of the painting having the same way it goes around. So it's very clear, and you can't see this, and so I really am making a point of it. It's an object. And I think that whole notion of setting up a, a dialogue about the shaped canvas being both a canvas and an object, a sculpture, and a painting, two-dimensional and three-dimensional in a way, in, in terms of the kinds of illusions that it sets up, really have made him, for me, a very, very interesting artist. Leon has been stymied by something, which I think stymies a great number of geometric artists in our era, and that is Ellsworth Kelly. Ellsworth Kelly has so overwhelmed our notion of what abstraction might be, and who the key, and what really the dominant person of abstraction in a certain sense, I think, for good reason, because he's a marvelous painter, and he's an extremely admirable person, and has been enormously kind of wonderful about his ways of dealing with curators. I mean, I've done, had the honor of working on a, on a show with him in 1981 at the sculpture. He's a charming, seductive, fantastic guy, um, and an extraordinary artist. But his work, in a sense, has taken a lot of the air out of the room for other artists whose work can be equally interesting and equally rich. Um, and Ellsworth, again, has this whole capacity to work with hard edge geometry. You see it in the Chatham series and work from the Tate 
that's um, furthest from me on the other side of the screen, and then the beautiful blue-green-red painting. Um, having gotten close to Ellsworth, I can always say that when he's in a good emotional relationship, uh, something that's really working, that's when the curves appear. When those squares show up, it's just broken up. Um, now, two more examples of constellations. Um, again, to show you the extremely vivid color sense of Leon Paul Smith, the extraordinary capacity he has to be, I think, enormously inventive about forms. And, as I say, there's something unbelievably radiant and upbeat about these works. Constellation 10 from 69, vertical blue-green. And I'm going to keep us moving ahead, and we'll see one more constellation where, um, by 1971, the constellations become even more complex. And so it's a, it's a circle that has been broken up into squares. It's about these amazing kinds of fragments of works. It's a fairly tall piece. It's about um, eight feet tall. Um, but it just it's marvelous the way it kind of crouches and looks just uh, so rich. The form itself is so rich that the circle has been made of squares and fragments of squares that the, the squares are broken up by, by curves, etc. All these things happen. Very, very complex, plotted out works. And I now see how he kind of did this, because now we've been able to go through really this extraordinary group of hundreds of drawings that he has left behind, finished <coughs> works. None of them dead on studies, for things are very few of them dead on studies, but he worked his way through his ideas on paper, as many artists do, but also then made his own compositions. On the other side is a painting from 78 called uh, Black Crossroads, and again, it's this black and white notion of what happens in surfaces, this dominant cross and, and the simplicity of the work. Now we'll take a little step back again. I was so struck um, in this exhibition, as I got the catalog in advance of seeing the exhibition, in the work of many of the artists who were there. But um, these two artists really sort of stood out for me. Um, Juan Melee, which you see an example closest to me, and then an example of Ramon uh, Vergara Guerrez. Right. I'm in front of, I mean, my Spanish is non-existent, so I apologize to everyone. Um, but really fascinating artists um, from Chile and um, from Argentina who really have their own sensibility. I know nothing about their work except the works that I've seen upstairs and then, you know, going Google mad and looking for other examples of their work. But they're so rich, and it's not as if they are looking at Leon Pope Smith, or Leon Pope Smith is looking at them, but in a way, they're looking across the culture at each other. And one of the exciting things is going to be getting these works together so that those, those rich dialogues, I think, can become even clearer to us and can be sort of fathomed more effectively. Now, as we move into the 80s in Leon's work, he was continuing to innovate, continuing to find his own forms. You see a range, arrangement in black and red from 1980, closest to me. These are about seven feet long, and they're individual panels, which he's put together. So he's no longer painting a form on, on a canvas. He's really making the canvas become its own kind of sculptural form. At the same time, he was making <coughs> a series of paintings that were in some way weather-related. This one's called Sunset Carry from 1983, in which you see this incredibly strong sun, the blackness that it is descending into um, in this work, an incredibly complex shape. I mean, this circle, which has these you know, four sides of parallelogram with a, a curve on one side. So the geometries of these works are incredibly complex, incredibly idiosyncratic, and quite rich. At the same time, in the 80s, he was exploring actually making sculptural-like shapes, where two individual canvases, we saw a little bit of that in the previous example of the arrangement in black and white. But in this case, we really see these two forms as it were, put together on the same wall. They'll often do them on, on the corner of a space, so they, they become like corner spaces. Very interesting works and kind of predate a lot of Richard Serra's explorations of very, very similar themes in terms of how when you place something on the wall, it can have enormous uh, sculptural dynamism to it. Now, um, at the very last you know, years of his life, again, he was continuing to innovate. We see big space, um, black line, like maybe close to me, and I, I think you can make out the edge of the painting there and how he's really got this, this form, very, very weighty on one side, very, very elegant on one another, this form just float in the whiteness of this canvas. And along it, alongside it, a gray rectangle black line from 1992, uh, uh, to me, one of the most sublime of his late paintings, just taking these simple forms, making them effectively 
get along with each other, um, having them establish this really rich visual dialogue, intellectual dialogue, formal dialogue, but doing it with an incredible elegance of means. Um, and then finally, a work um, which, which has disappeared. Which is, well, anyway, um, so there's one, there's one image which decided to manage, so we'll go back to um, this. But the final image is the icon. I will, I will describe it to you. And hopefully I'll get it's called uh, Blue. It's called Blue Cross, and I'm about to get Blue Cross Red Shield or something um, to find it. It's it there. It's gone. Um, in any event, this particular work was done just the year he died, and it's a blue field with a black lines making a cross. And there was a, a lovely photograph of him when he was older to match the one when he was younger. But um, right to the last moment of his life, when he was 90 years old, um, born, as I said, in 1906, dying in 1996, he was making terrific works. And what's nice now is with the emergence you know, of, of work from his estate and from, and, and from the foundation and from other sources, because there were quite a few works sold during his own lifetime, we have a bigger, a bigger and a richer sense of the particular way that Leon you know, Paul Smith used color, form, and space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patterson. It was it was great to kind of get a sense of a deeper sense of one of the artists in the exhibition. Um, I'm very excited to now introduce uh, Don Wasim, who's an American abstract painter living in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Don worked primarily with compositional elements such as light, space, and color. He was elected a member of American Abstract Artists in 1997 and became president of that group in 2004. Uh, he's been exhibiting his work nationally and internationally for over three decades, and his works included in the public collections of the Cincinnati Art Museum, Peabody Essex Museum, and the Missoula Art Museum in Montana. Please help me welcome Don Wasim. Had, my schooling had really like uh, encouraged uh, more uh, 
improvisational way of working, uh, uh, you know, gesturally and uh, uh, pushing pain around. And I really wanted to do that. I, you know, I love Gustin, Philip Gustin's work, or Kuning, and I was never able to make that work for myself. Uh, and after I'd gotten away from my school for a while, I was trying to figure out how to proceed. And, and um, well, one of the things I just decided to do was to try to bring subject matter to forms that I've been using uh, just formally, like abstractly. Uh, and um, um, this is sort of where I began in 1980. This is a drawing of a floor plan of a place that I did some work in. Uh, it's like the rough drawing that a carpenter would do to indicate where things are supposed to go. Um, the forms went, represented like the actual location of the, the things. The dark shape that's marking down is, was the doorway. The bars are like steps up to a platform. Um, where before I might have like placed these things sort of arbitrarily here and there to try to create a composition, here they were coming from a real life uh, place. And for me that was important because um, um, that gave me something to work with and to work against. Um, if the composition was unbalanced because of the location of the real life objects, um, I, I wouldn't move up to, you know, I would find other ways to balance the, uh, the image, uh, either through color, the weight of the marks, uh, you know, any, anything but, you know, shifting anything. And I, and I still use that to a degree. I will establish a form and then find ways to make it work. Um, <clears throat> after I'd done, uh, most of these I'd done on paper, and um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, transfer that to canvas somehow, and <clears throat> I wasn't quite sure how to do it because of the placement of the image on the paper. Um, <clears throat> so then, this, this was the first painting I did like that. Um, sorry for the quality of the image, the year. Uh, uh, the older work I have, I have to reshoot. Um, the um, <clears throat> what I decided to do was to locate the uh, the space of the room, as it were, in, in the middle of the canvas, and then uh, color the area in around the perimeter. And I and I found that that gave that like a different kind of space than uh, uh, what I'd been working with before. Uh, it gave me something to like step over to get into the space of the picture. And coming from my uh, sort of Greenbergian formalism that <clears throat> I was into uh, early on as a student, you know, that was kind of a violation of the picture plane. And um, it opened things up for me. Um, <clears throat> it was a way of uh, creating a space that was not like an illusionistic space. Um, but something that was a bit more visual, you know, like your your eye really moves around, and there's like if you follow the the black marks, um, in a way they represent the way you might enter an empty room, and sort of you pace it out, and you get a feel for the of the space of an empty room. Um, uh, over time. Um, my work started to get a bit more uh, geometrically st uh, structured. Uh, the edges got a little bit straighter. And um, um, <clears throat> this one, the uh, it's a, almost a bit more suggestive of a uh, landscape kind of space. Uh, this painting is probably from about 1988. I don't quite remember the, the exact date, uh, but it was pretty consistent from that yellow painting on that uh, I've had a uh, color on the perimeter of the painting. Um, and that, that would set like the tone of the uh, emotional tenor, generally. Because you'll notice that, uh, especially when I get to my more recent work, which is the center of the space is primarily black. Um, <clears throat> this painting was, you know, as you can see, it's became, becoming a bit more straight edge. Um, still kind of uh, a bit atmospheric. Um, this was no longer coming from a, a floor plan. Um, 
the image comes from the structure of a Mondrian painting, which I then like had to squeeze into like a different format than the original painting. <coughs> um, this led to um, um, a number of works that were really grid based, and I would try to um, tweak them uh, to, to break out of the um, the uh, rigidity of the, the grid of it, I would try to open it up somewhat. Um, after I'd done a series of those grid-based paintings, which tended to all be kind of hazy and had a large area of white, I became really interested in black paintings. Um, they were very, whatever I'd come across, like the early Frank Stella paintings or black and white Felbert Phillies, um, Reinhardt, um, there's a great big Clifford Sill at the Art Institute of Chicago uh, that's all black. It's really intense painting. I found that <coughs> to be generally the most challenging and least seductive and uh, difficult, so I wanted to take up the challenge of them. Uh, so this is the, one of the, among the first ones that I did. Um, you can see there's a translucency to the uh, top layer that's over the white cross. Um, <clears throat> that's also like kind of remained a, a trademark in my work since. Um, <clears throat> that creates a, uh, a layering of the space that implies that there's you know stuff going on underneath. Um, I mask things off to paint them in, and um, that's a detail that really uh, plays fairly important part in the work because you can see there's a buildup of paint on the edge of the tape and you can see it underneath the, the black center. So that, you know, it implies that the shape goes on and continues underneath. So that gives you a very different reading of space than if um, you didn't see that where you, you would read that as interlocking planes rather than a layering. And that um, that's a subtle uh, reading of space, but it really makes a difference in how people perceive the work. Uh, this painting was uh, uh, the first one that I sort of brought in <clears throat> some diagonals after a lot of uh, horizontal vertical axes, and uh, it was a little too dramatic for me at the time, so I kind of pulled away from it. Um, <clears throat> started working on wood panels in uh, like about 2000 and one of the uh, one of the things that seemed to happen was that the um, the paintings read much faster than when they were on canvas the uh, the ones on canvas absorbed the light a bit more they were maybe a, a bit more reticent and these make a much faster uh, graphic impact and uh, get your attention a bit faster uh, but after that, hopefully you'll slow down and notice that there's a lot more detail and subtlety going on. After, uh, most of my early wood paintings were kind of in the smaller size, two foot range. And um, I began to feel the urge to do like much larger paintings, but working on wood, they become very heavy and cumbersome. Um, and after struggling with a few of those, and, you know, they, they would warp and really, it really became like a problem. Uh, I came up with this solution of making paintings that felt large but without taking up a lot of uh, real estate. This, this painting is 18 by 19 inches across. Each section is a separate panel that is bolted together. But because it's like a long horizontal, uh, it fills your peripheral vision, so, you know, it feels much bigger than it is. Um, Looking at Barnett Newman was uh, was really helpful in helping me like figure out how to make these paintings work. Uh, I learned a lot from looking at other artists, whether it's uh, Barnett Newman or Ed Reinhardt or Titian. Or I'm just really interested in painting. It's not for me. It's not a stylistic thing. I get as much out of figurative, representational paintings as I do from abstract work. So. Um, I'm just in, really interested in painting. 
Uh, this is a painting from about 2005. It's called uh, Another Morning. Uh, I think that paint, the, the magenta, the real painting, is more vivid than it's how it's reading here. Um, and I felt that that was a point where the color in my work started to really key up. Um, one of the really important things that I've tried to do is counter the expectations of what a black painting, what people would assume a black painting is like. Um, uh, I have done like some paintings that are dark and somber, but I've also worked really hard to uh, counter, to, to eliminate any sense of mourning from the work and to make the, the black not feel um, heavy and uh, uh, some of them are more playful than others, but it's it's been really important for me to like work against those expectations. Um, you mentioned earlier that the uh, book that was uh, someone had like theories about the meanings of different colors, and um, if I were to get involved with that, I would definitely like find myself like working to counter <laughs> all of his like sort of readings. You know? Make the peaceful, calm colors like agitate you. <laughs> That's my contrary. <laughs> uh, this is painting also from about 2005, where I was trying to um, break away from doing things that were uh, really contained in horizontal and vertical axes. And it was one of the first ones that brought in a diagonal. Um, this became kind of problematic for me because there was a tendency for the lower uh, right-hand corner to kick out and just kind of warp the space. I mean, I think this painting is okay, and, and there was a few others that worked, but most of them I, I wasn't happy with. Uh, I did want to break away from the symmetry that I've been using for so long, um, but, I, but I wasn't quite sure where to go with it. Um, <clears throat> But because of that warp in the space was, was unsatisfying to me, I went back to a more subtle shifting of, of the overlapping planes. Like this one just drops down and shifts over a little bit. Um, and I kept that up for a while too, um, um, until I was, uh, got to a point where I could uh, bring diagonals in again that weren't uh, throwing things out of black. Uh, this is an installation shot from uh, an exhibition uh, in 2007. Uh, the painting on the left isn't mine, it's by Mark Dagley. Um, this painting is uh, called Ava, and um, it took me a really long time to find the color on the top and bottom for this painting. I tried all kinds of possibilities and nothing was was working and sometimes um, I just when I'm deciding on the color for a painting uh, at times that may I may find that early on and other times it takes it's a bit more work and this one was a lot of work um, <clears throat> I started looking outside of you know of various things out in the real world to, to get some inspiration and one day I was uh, driving on the BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, and a little copper-colored Cooper, Mini Cooper went sitting by, and I was like, that's it, that's the kind of color I need. <laughs> and the next time I was at the studio, I started playing around with that, and sort of found this color for this painting. And then uh, a friend of mine's daughter was visiting from Amsterdam, and um, her name was Ava. So I titled the painting Ava after her, I also like how the word Ava looks in relation to all the angles, because the A and the B, the angles reflect the, uh, the F. Um, this is a shot of a corner of my studio. Uh, I work on a lot of paintings at once. Uh, things are built up in layers, so uh, I can have you know, 10 to 12 paintings going. And, uh, and I do something and it takes a few days before I can do the next step. Um, 
so there's a lot of work in my studio, and, and when people come by, uh, a lot of times they expect that um, because of all the black that I use, that it's going to be like kind of a dark, gloomy place. But uh, a lot of times I walk in, and the first thing they'll say was, "Wow, look at all this color." And I think this has led to uh, uh, people doing installations of my work of you know the sort of salon style hanging because it replicates that feel of walking into the studio for the first time. Um, I've also had work done, uh, shown in the exact opposite, whether it be a small, say, 12-inch painting on a 20-foot wall. And that works. That has worked, too. So it's, it, there's all kinds of possibilities of how my work can be installed. And I'm open to, to all of it. Um, I get to know things in a certain way in the studio after a while. Um, so I'm always delighted to, to see what someone else will, will do for an installation. I'll learn something from it, but they won't associate things the same way I, I did. Um, in the show at the uh, Alejandro von Hartz, she hung two green paintings of different size together. And that was a really unexpected thing for me to, to see. I was, and I was very delighted with it. I was really happy with that. In fact, I mean, I think she did a great job with the installation. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, a painting from about 2009. Um, I tended to, to have the color uh, running across the top and bottom band, and I decided to see what it would be like to have it on the, uh, just on the sides. Um, it changes the, the feel of the space a lot. It contains it more. Kind of similar to when the color went all around the perimeter. Um, they're, they're not as expansive as the um, paintings where the color is, uh, goes laterally across. Um, I think the rest of these slides are um, of work in the past few years. And so. I mean, I don't really have anything specific about a particular one. Um, I have a couple of side projects, and this is one where I do these paintings on styrofoam, on the same kind of uh, blue or pink styrofoam that uh, is used for insulation. Uh, the styrofoam is coated with a two-part plastic epoxy, which protects it from the paint solvents. Um, I do them, I paint them the same way that I do on wood. Um, but what's really interesting is people react to them very differently. People that might be a little intimidated by, you know, serious uh, geometric formal work um, tend to, to, to feel that this is a lot more uh, uh, viewer friendly, you could say. Um, <coughs> Especially when they're at the studio and I hand one over to them, it's like they're, they're just always a kind of delight in the, the, how light they are. And, um, it, it's great to have a side project that, that relates to your other work, but it gets a really different response. This is also a painting on styrofoam. The white ants on the top is not paint, though. It's, um, it's actually uh, spackling. And this is one that was also done with uh, uh, plaster. The, uh, the painter's stuff in the four corners is uh, spackle. The wider is drunk compound with plaster of Paris mixed into it, and the uh, top band uh, going across that's grayer is uh, just joint compound. And that's been sealed with like a uh, an acrylic varnish, so that that's what sort of grayed the color a bit. <clears throat> uh, this is a painting called "Delayed Green" from 2009. Um, you know, when I mentioned earlier that I I uh, don't ship the composition too much once I start uh, with this one, I basically like. Establish the two large black forms in the, in the center, 
and uh, with a black and white divide, and I and it was it, it sat very still, and, and that my my problem was how to make it sort of visually interesting. So it took it took a lot of very it took me a long time to figure this out by trying out a lot of different little shifts and, and variations. Um, but in the end, I think by pulling one edge forward on the top, on the top middle uh, on this side, uh, a little bit more forward than from the bottom, and then you had the uh, diagonal over there, it brings your eye in this sort of back and forth like an edge shape. And then also like the little color bands had something to you know a lot to do with that too. Uh, generally, the color, the additional line of color, would have been symmetrical. But in this case, having the orange right up against the black, and on the other side, the orange was against the white, um, it was really hard to get them to sort of balance. And I decided to put it on the outside, because then you would see it against the white of the wall. So it was similar to how uh, you would see it on the, on the far side. <coughs> um, I was surprised to see the, uh, the Pulp Smith painting, Black Crosswords on 78. I'd never seen it. And uh, um, when I uh, started tilting like these cross forms that I've been doing, you know, they became a lot more dynamic. And, uh, so it was kind of fun to see the, the Smith painting. Um, this, this one I called High Time, because again, it was one that took me a while to figure out. So. By the time I had it finished, it was high time to be done with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this painting is called Sidekick. Um, I avoided doing verticals for a really long time because they tended to always read as doorways or as a figure. And finally I gave up worrying about that and just like tried to figure out the paintings for, for what they were. Never mind the associations. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a purist in any way. Uh, how do I get rid of that? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very much a formalist, but I'm not pure about you know purist about any of the things. They're uh, uh, informed by a lot of things from my. Uh, from my uh, outside experience. I don't know why this is frozen. Okay. <coughs> um, I did a series of paintings with these sort of diamonds in the center. Um, I call them the Argot series. Um, and I've, I've basically just showed this one to show that it, you know, that I don't always have a really dense center. Sometimes they open up a bit more. I like to have things that have, you know, different readings um, to alternate between the, the uh, something that may be positive in one way but also yeah. be negative. Uh, the, the white wedges can be either way. Um, the glossy blacks over the matte blacks, they can reverse. Uh, that can happen, especially if you're moving across uh, as you're viewing a painting. Um, it, it keeps things a lot more active, you know, for, for work that is, people tend to associate with being still. Um, uh, geometric paintings can, can have a lot of movement and dynamicism to them. Uh, this one is called Fear. Um, I don't know how, how well this will read here, but there's um, um, there's real curve to the sort of space as you read the space uh, because of like a, a very slight drop in the the lines that uh, that come off of it, the point of the uh, white wedge. There's a painting that's sort of related to that in the show at the Alejandro, so it's called Slip. <clears throat> um, I never quite understood how this 
this one did the uh, this sort of curving space, but um, it, was, it was pretty. Uh, I, I was pretty happy with it because it uh, it was a kind of movement I hadn't seen in, in other sort of hard edge geometric work. The reason I'm showing this this uh, painting, uh, this photograph, is uh, when I saw. When I saw Michelle's dress, I, I was like, yeah, that's the kind of color I use. I, I could really like it. <laughs> <laughs> so this led to this painting called it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, some, sometimes I'll start off with, with knowing what the black form will be like, and sometimes I'll start off with the color, and in this case, it was the color. Now, if you compare the color to the, in the painting to the actual fabric, I'm sure it'd be way off, because uh, in different photographs that I saw of the dress, it was, uh, you know, they really varied pretty wildly. Um, and, and also I had to make adjustments to it as, as the painting uh, uh, got, you know, advanced in various stages, so at, at some point I had to put the picture out of my mind and look at what was actually in front of me. Oh, this painting is uh, a five foot square. It's the largest I've done on wood, uh, and it's about as big as I could handle. And they get pretty heavy. Um, <clears throat> this one was a, I call it a Zox composition. It's a little homage to uh, Larry Zox after he passed away. Uh, he had done some paintings that uh, had these sort of like elongated triangular shapes, and this was a reference to, to him. <clears throat> um, this was another uh, attempt at verticality. Um, and this painting reminds me a bit of like uh, some of those Wayne Tebow paintings of San Francisco, the streets of San Francisco. <coughs> I did it, I actually did it around the time that I was having a show in San Francisco. But I wasn't thinking of it consciously until after I had been there. <clears throat> um, again, a tall, narrow, vertical painting. This one's uh, 48 by 12 inches. It's perfect practice. This is Otto. It was in my last show in New York. That's a, uh, it's 32 inches by 60. <clears throat> uh, this one, uh, um, it's also a, a painting from the last, last spring. Um, the, uh, if you see like a slight curve in that line, that's just, uh, it's completely an illusion. It's really very straight. This is a painting called Cave, or Square. I've, I've gotten interested in like all these sort of like weird angles, and, you know, really move your eye across, and create a lot of movement. You know, when you work with so few elements, and, you know, I basically have two blacks, some white wedges, and a color or two, everything becomes uh, pretty important, and, and any slight shift can really change the space and alter the, uh, the feel and resonance of the painting. <clears throat> this is a fairly recent one called the Full Stop. A bit more sign-like than my where it tends to be. And that's in the show in Brooklyn right now. And uh, just to show you that I don't always have black in, in the center, this is this also happens to be a painting on styrofoam. Uh, the two reds is just a different sheen. It's the same red top and bottom, but um, just read differently because of the different finish. <clears throat> So that brings us back to 
Temple, which is in the show at Alamandas. I purposely didn't include any other paintings from the show so that you wouldn't feel like you've seen it. Now, you know, if you want to see the show, you have to go see it. <laughs> um, one thing is that uh, it's really important to see the paintings in real life because there's a lot of different uh, surfaces to them um, that doesn't really come across uh, on these kinds of images. And I um, just want to add on one thing, which I sent the image of this painting to a friend of mine who's a poet and he sent this back. <clears throat> the, the painting's called Tumble. He's a, he wrote, Tumble, titled Tumble. Two slow, low blue bands above and below the ochre olive stretches streaks. Sloop, two sloops. Diagonal, bending in tandem. A caught somersault times two. Again, plant, built, whirl, hinge, floor span. Thank you. And teaching this type of work actually is difficult to slide since I've been doing this very room. So it's fantastic that we have this exhibition upstairs uh, in terms of teaching contemporary art. What I'd like to do now is just ask um, Patterson and Don and uh, Costanza to come up and join me up here for a little bit. And uh, what I'm going to do is maybe just start some conversation with a couple of, of my thoughts and uh, then open it up to to all of you who I think will probably have some more questions for perhaps maybe Patterson and Don and, and the, the rest of the crew. It's very interesting, you know, uh, to hear all of your responses, which are so uh, very excited. But uh, to inform you that the history of art and the way it's been sort of structured over time in a very Euro-American context has sort of shied away from uh, work that really, I think, is not just optical, but is um, embodied as well. So it sort of brings up the body through through the optical. So that was just sort of one note I, I wanted to bring up. and. and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I also have to bring up Clement Greenberg um, as well, and his, uh, he was an influential American art critic for those of you that don't know him, and uh, had a lot of power um, in terms of who was shown and who was collected definitely in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, one of his um, important essays, Barnard's Painting, which was done in 1960, he argues again, too, for the importance of of color, but through again the optical only, an optical that perhaps is somewhat disembodied. Uh, and again, just to kind of throw that out there, is something that's historically sort of important to, to bring up. And I think sort of the last thing I just wanted to say is that, uh, you know, there's a sense that all, all these works are creating spaces of some kind, like the very embodied spaces. Um, and that there's this complexity in what is seemingly very simple. And I, I think I want to emphasize that word seemingly, um, in some sense, because I think that came up a lot earlier, that um, they seemed very simple, yet you know, they were bringing up you know, very uh, strong emotions and complex ones. And I think that's very interesting, that they create this stasis, perhaps, between two states uh, of fixed points of some kind in, in, in some way. But those are just a couple thoughts that I wanted to start off with. And I was hoping maybe we could just start by kind of going down the line and, and uh, 
maybe you want to bounce off of some of those thoughts. Especially, Don, because you mentioned formalism a little earlier and uh, your relationship to it. It'd be great to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's pretty complicated and ongoing, but um, I mean, to me, one of the most interesting things is that uh, given where I started from in the mid-70s as a, you know, in art school, and the degree of influence that, that uh, Greenberg formalism had at the time, uh, it was seen as, you know, and so many other art theories were, were always exclusive. They, they, are, they were always about what, you know, it can't be this, it can't be that. And what's it's been really great for me to, to see over the years is that it's now like you can think of modernism as being much more inclusive. And I think for younger artists, they, they, they work with it that way. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's all this stuff out there that, that we can work with now that, uh, you know, 50 years ago were black and death issues between artists. Um, you know, you mentioned I'm part of the American Abstract Artist, and, and those people would argue you know, to the death about gestural uh, abstraction versus hard edge geometric abstraction. And for younger artists, that's not an issue anymore. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's an option for them. And you, that doesn't mean you can't create work that's just by, uh, you know, any less vital, but uh, it's a more uh, open, uh, accepting sort of attitude, which I'm you know, more comfortable with. I'm really lucky that I don't take a course with you because I never could remember all the questions. <laughs> uh, so maybe you should focus on one question you might want to ask me, or I'll pass it to her because she's obviously much brighter and she can remember all those questions. <laughs> there are too many for me, I'm sorry to say. I don't think I answered that either. No, you did, you did. I think I kind of yeah. wanted to give a couple because I thought that you get to tag off of one of them, but obviously it backfired on me. So I think maybe I'll ask you a very specific question um, Ben Patterson about Leon Park Smith's work um, and this kind of gets this, this idea of art history inclusion and what kind of material gets included and what doesn't and when it gets included um, and I'm interested in kind of thinking about that in terms of Leon Park Smith's work. Well it's interesting with an artist like Smith and I suspect many of the artists that you've collected they were very very hard-working people so they created enormous bodies of work and we have, at least in the States now, a whole system of the creation of artist foundations, which have really come out of the desire of artists to be able to keep their work together after they die, um, which they normally couldn't unless they established a legal entity to do so, because the tax situation would be so burdensome. If an artist is sold, whatever ever works in <coughs> her or his life, those works would get taxed at something like the value of the sales value and they could have hundreds of works left at the end of their life and that could be impossible for them. So enormous numbers of artists are now creating foundations which are I think going to really change some of the, the power in the art world because you've got a foundation like the Pauli Krasner Foundation or the Warhol Foundation or the up and coming Rauschenberg Foundation now that have incredible assets. I mean millions, Lichtenstein Foundation hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of assets one way or another and they're all doing different things. The Joan Mitchell Foundation is doing incredible work with supporting artists to be lecturers in museums all across the city and they're doing lots of targeted um, things which would be helping younger artists as they emerge. They have a whole system, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, this is not the answer that you were expecting, um, the Joan Mitchell Foundation has a whole system of looking at five or six of the best graduate schools and, uh, to, and having those schools pick students who could get a bridge fund, which would allow them, after they go to graduate school, to have a little time to make their work. I mean, they're finally making their work, they're finally in the world, and yet then they have to confront the fact that, well, they can't get a job, or they could get a job. Um, it would take all the time that they have. So I think that's a really interesting issue. And the correlate of that issue is that all this work really gets put aside so it doesn't have to be sold right away, it doesn't have to be assessed right away, it doesn't have to be really in some way um, 
make its, its way into the culture more rapidly than it should. And so as a result, deliberative thoughts can be made, and maybe there are calculations on the part of the dealer. We're going to show early work, and then two years later we're going to show the next work. They create, really, effectively business plans for the estates of artists. And whether that's a good or bad thing, we could all have different points of view. But I'd say it's probably a good thing, because a tremendous deliberation is then made about, look, we're not going to overwhelm the world by saying that there are you know, many hundreds of drawings by Leon Cold Smith and just sort of send them out into the world. We're going to do it in a very intelligent, cogent way. We'll have different shows at different times. We'll have a museum show, we'll have a gallery show, etc. So we can begin to assess the intelligence that lies behind these works of art. Um, without them all being sort of forced onto the market. So I would say that there's an opportunity now to look at the careers of artists in much more careful, cogent ways. And the, the notion of, of this, these studios crammed with work, which sometimes is very hard to be sorted out, is a very touching photograph of your studio. It's just There's a lot of work that an artist makes. And the percentage of that work, unless the artist is extraordinarily successful. The percentage of that work that actually gets out into the world during their lifetime is a very, very small percentage. So what are you going to do about that? How are you going to deal with that? And hopefully that will all be done with much greater premeditation now than it's ever been done before. But in the case of, of, of Smith, he made a lot of work. There's still a fair amount of work in the foundation. There's still a lot of work to be done to take the fact that he, because I think of his particular personality construct, he had a lot of different dealers. Many of those galleries have failed or they closed or whatever. Their records are, are very hard to find. So we're now trying to piece together the puzzle of this person's creativity. And one painting can shift everything. I mean, one, one work of art can make you really rethink, oh, how did that idea develop? Well, that's an idea that I thought came in the late 80s. It actually was first making its itself known in 1968 in that one drawing that was made. So all of this, I think, now can become much better. We also have phenomenal databases now. Just nothing like this ever existed before in the history of humanity. And even an obscure artist, I mean, someone was writing me, a friend has a particular portrait that they like, and they were asking my advice about this portrait. Well, I could Google this artist. This artist is so obscure. But there were like 12 images on Google. So this, we have kinds of data that, that are now available for us. We have kinds of information. We have kinds of ways of connecting the careers of artists. I mean, as I looked at your work, I said, well, he didn't mention Al Held. He should have mentioned Al Held. Um, because obviously Al Held was a big influence on him. I mean, he flattened the painting. He didn't use the gestural thick surfaces that, that Held used in his work. But you know, you really can begin to see how the, the pieces of this puzzle fit together in a wonderful way. So I don't think I answered your question at all, but um, <laughs> I, I did have an opportunity to say some of the things that I wish I'd been able to say. Already. <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. I could need A plus if you were my student. Oh, <laughs> I'm transferring here tomorrow. <laughs> this never happened to me in my whole <laughs> academic career. I, I get nervous about being on panels, but no, now that I know you don't have to answer the questions. <laughs> it's a whole new approach. <laughs> The postmodern approach to panels. Don't bother to answer the question. Make up your own question. Uh, okay. <laughs> now we can turn to the academic. She's going to answer the question. She's going to get an A. Now I'm nervous. I'm not sure if I have to phrase my question properly. Um, I was really interested if you could talk about whether or not the fact that uh, color, color field, is something that is largely. Um, very New York City in terms of the way art history has been constructed, and very 1950s and 60s. And, and it seems like your show really breaks all those boundaries. I mean, it's showing that artwork is happening today, and um, it happened and is still happening all over the world. Does that get factored into how you're collecting? Yeah, if you're, if you're thinking about uh, the fact that a, a lot of the artworks that you have in the collection don't get shown a lot um, in the U.S., for instance, um, they're not exhibited. We don't. We don't. Uh, we, there was a show in uh, Berlin that I was talking about earlier that the uh, Deutsche Guggenheim put together on color field. It did not include Latin American art, so it was only about sort of the 1950s and 60s 
And uh, so I, I was interested if that factors in, if you're thinking about the politics of, of the, um, the work that you're putting in, if it's really just like gut response, like, you know, this is no, what I want. Like. Well, of course, a little bit of gut response, but a little bit of the idea of trying to, to, to form a corpus that is interesting and it has like different variations or representations of many things that are like approaching the same thing but from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. so, like trying to create a border uh, approach. So thinking more about the forms in some sense yeah. and how they play together. But it seems to me that I mean you're you're in such an unbelievable position as an art historian being able to you know really have this material and live with it. I mean Bill Rubin, the famous museum of modern art curator, always said in defending the fact that he was kind of a private dealer, um, as as well as one of the great you know, curators of our time, he said, look, the only way I'm going to understand these works is to live with them. So he decided to live with the David Smith, he decided to live with the Holly, he decided to live with a number of extraordinary works. Most people don't have that opportunity. Um, but he was, as I say, probably arguably one of the greatest um, post-war curators who existed. Um, you also have been able to identify an area, a zone, which is, in a sense, underloved uh, and, under, and underappreciated. And so that's an extraordinary thing because not only are you buying works of art, but you're really, you're bringing them back to life, effectively. And you're also creating dialogues between those works of art that really might have existed before. I mean, I think really what, it's gonna be fascinating what we're gonna learn about how much these artists really knew about each other. I mean, we think we live in this multimedia age now and everybody knows everything because, but obviously there were very strong lines of communication before. Maybe it was art news as opposed to the internet. But people were looking at art news and they were looking and like dwelling on little photographs of mm -hmm. the show that they saw and creating a whole new body of work based on that. I mean, many, many artists that I know that I would meet in New York, they moved to New York and they had had art, art news. Um, and art news became this kind of Bible for them. And they were getting so involved with just a tiny reproduction. But from that reproduction, because they were so embedded in it, they, they really learned as much as they might have learned from somebody who could, you know, sort of vastly Google the internet's resources. So are, do you have like a, a, like a, a master list of the things that you'd like to get? Are you, you must be constantly making discoveries people you've never even heard of who are extraordinary, and yet there they are with, with bodies of work which are available to be seen and appreciated. No, like we are always open. Yeah. We are always learning and getting to know new things. Yes, there are things yeah. that are ideal that we think of it. I have, uh, actually, I have a problem. I use a lot of art price to follow many of the artists I like. Um, um, at the moment, I have already 300. And uh, when I want to add someone more, I need to be one of the older Jews. <laughs> uh, uh, I like a lot my following <coughs> of the collection. Uh, collecting uh, the California School and the Washington School. And really I'm so much surprised, and since you're Americans mostly here, that it's totally undervalued. Totally undervalued. I can't believe it. Because works from the 60s, when I started, started to, to study these, these two schools, uh, I bought pieces from the 60s, really historic pieces, made for 6,000, 8,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, an amazing work, uh, with a historic work, and are, are actually at the moment, at the present, still at the present, uh, totally undervalued. Uh, I did leak it like uh, three, four months ago, trying to buy a piece of Fowler. You know Fowler? Fowler, with P H uh, A L L E R from Germany. Okay, and that is that very, very linked. A lot linked mm -hmm. to, to, to look at that with the, the California school, in you know, some way with Laro Sox and Car Benjamin. And uh, uh, I couldn't buy it for 4,000 euros, mm -hmm. a large scale, like two by two. So I think that we have all the curator and st historic um, art, history teachers and curator here. <coughs> I, I think that you have all of you uh, 
a large way to do in order to, to bring to the present again the value of those circuits are quite uh, forgotten. Forget, uh, forgotten. I mean, one thing that's fascinating is you get someone like Anne Truitt, whose work was, was, <coughs> wasn't different when she made it than it is now. It was the same work. But now we can look at her work and you get a career like hers, which was sort of an eclipse, and then she has these daughters, and the daughters yeah. make the relationship with Matthew Marx, and then you couldn't get an Andrew if you bank them. I mean, they're so incredibly expensive now, and this work. And this was work that really languished for uh, at least 15 years, I mean, some time before, a after she died, and certainly languished during her own time. There was a tremendous respect, and she was someone who was really picked up on by Clinton Greenberg. It made no impact, no impact whatsoever. <laughs> So in other words, as big a critic as he was, for a certain very small number of artists at the beginning, I think the continuing people that he, like Michael Steiner, nothing. I mean, he, he did everything in his power to help Michael Steiner. It didn't work. The sculpture just didn't resonate with any, anybody else besides the two of them. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think that to do again, you know, it's something different. Uh, you remember again, I, I mentioned before, the response that I uh, showed in the United States in 1965 was a key exhibition for the old art and cinema. But maybe someone has to take care to do something about the color field, about the average, uh, about all the color field. And brought to the present the value of the California School and the Washington School, linked also with many German artists that are made at the same time the same kind of style that uh, should bring the value of those surface because when you talk about color field always you talk about the same you talk about Kevin Nolan you talk about Stella uh, you talk about Elvis Kelly but there are many many I from Argentina I, I think it's like beginning to open up sorry I think it's beginning to yeah. open up I think the color field stuff was so tied to Clement Greenberg uh, the exhibition in Berlin is starting to open yeah. Uh, look at it from a different angle. There was a show at Mitchell Linus recently of Ken Nolan's, mm -hmm. and uh, the catalog essay talks about all kinds of stuff that, that Greenberg would have expunged, you know, things about his, uh, when he was in the Air Force, and how uh, that could have influenced some of his imagery. The fact that uh, in the past, you know, five or six years, we've been able to see uh, a number of exhibitions in the States of Latin American modernist work is like really great. Um, you know, it's, a lot of that stuff is new to me and uh, I'm really excited to see it. Um, when you were talking about, you know, like setting things in reproduction, right. I know like magazines were being sent down to South America, but a lot of them were probably had black and white reproductions. They did, yeah. And so the artists didn't know what the colors were, so they came up with their own colors. <laughs> And so, they, you know, you're not seeing the same old thing. That they look really fresh now. Uh, it's a, a lot of work that I see coming out of Europe that's still like in doing hard edge work. Uh, like Germans and Dutch are still like working a lot with primaries. But like the Belgian artists, they use all kinds of weird pastels and and these mixed colors that that um, uh, to me are like you know much fresher and interesting. The same with seeing the, the older work from South America. Like the concrete movement in Argentina emerged in the 40s. So it had like some delay. <coughs> and the, by that time, they would receive like images in black and white. So they couldn't really see the, the work of the brush strokes from Bondian. And at that time, like those artists, they did not have the government approval because the government would support artists that were more socialists and more like figurative and easy to understand the message. And so they would say that this art was not worthy and say that much worse things than that. Mm -hmm. And they had the support for the, from the industrial, like the industrial paints, and they would like give their sort of own interpretation with the ideas that they read. <coughs> it had to be like a, not gestual or not related to the artist, but like it was a a machine, like something subjective, no, not okay. subjective, but objective, and and they would paint like with perfect, like if it was the paint of a car without any line that you could see from the hand of the artist. So it's interesting how like the the media 
ends up like generating new things. It's like it's the medium, but it's yeah. like the end itself. Um, yeah. Patterson, like I wanted to ask you, you mentioned something earlier about how you were in such such a horrible time, and that the artwork really kind of like brightens up your day in some sense. I know, I know you probably meant just somewhat of a joke too, but it's interesting. I mean, there there is all this influx of interest all of a sudden in this kind yeah, of. Art. I meant it somewhat rhetorically, but I really also do believe that it's fascinating that this work is is cropping up at this point yeah. and really <coughs> engaging to a lot of a new generation of collectors, etc. And I think it does have to do with it being so cheerful. I mean, it seems to be cheerful, it seems to be organized, it seems to be a world that's, that's in some, it has some sense of control over itself, whereas I, I just don't think we feel that our world has much control over itself right now. We read, you know, the stock market gyrates wildly day after day, week after week, and, you know, these pundits try to make us understand why this is happening, but they do a miserable job. Um, because, in fact, they, they don't really in any way make it clear as to why the world is, is, is in quite the turmoil that it's in. And we're also so hyper-conscious of how much turmoil the world is in because we can track all the countries that are fighting that now. We can, and, and if we want to get you know, more information, we can maybe go to their new, the news media, actually, to figure out what's going on in that particular part of the world. So I do think this, world is, this work is a kind of an anecdote to that. At the same time, I'm fascinated that it emerges at a moment when media saturation is completely taken over, the photograph is completely taken over, our consciousness about what the best art is. And um, this is very contrary to that. It's, it's very well, it's very handmade. It's, um, it has nothing to do with image saturation or, or imagery and what imagery tells us about the world. It has nothing to do with consumerism that I can really, I think mean, it's hard to track what the, this, this group of, of painters has to do with the consumer phenomena, uh, with many of the issues that are, are, the, are the dominant issues of our own time. So. There is that notion that, and I always look back, minimalism, minimalism emerged at the moment of so, a high social change. In other words, the world was in the most turmoil of, of social change, of people redefining what gender was, redefining what race could mean in our culture, etc. And what's emerging? Minimalism, this incredibly reductive sensibility. So on some level you can say that the art does not reflect its time, it's the counter-reflection of its time. Um, and it then reflect, reflects its time when you're a little bit further away from its time. Maybe you can sense, oh, that was the connection that was made by that art. Or that art, which we weren't even looking at then, but which we now know occurred during that time. So I, I think there is something wonderfully upbeat about this work. It's something cheerful. And, and you know, we're, we're selling for whatever reason more works by Leon Paul Smith than we have before. In other words, there's greater interest in what he's doing. There's greater interest in, as I say, there's a whole from, I mean, the individual and true. I mean, there was simply no interest in the work, and now there's hyper interest. So, you have to think what's causing that to happen. So that's what I think. We want to be cheered up, and I want to thank you for for this exhibition because it cheers us up. I should open the floor up to the the audience. Like, I just wanted to make reference to Baroque music. I always wondered why I found it so exciting and, uh, and exalted to listen to Baroque music. And I recently read that it's the tension between the ground bass and the lyrical upper uh, line of the music. And then looking at your painting, I was so moved by the tension and the containment of the color bands and uh, the way the picture field draws you in, and the tension between the very subtle side of forms and the excitement of the color. So, I think that what you were saying about the social matrix, I think it causes you to pause, to take a breath, and to keep looking, and to see more and more in the very subtle interplay of very few elements, but just a nice counterbalance to the culture, which is the quick sound bite, and the quick visual get. Um, the more I looked at that painting, for example, behind, but it's not, it's not there anymore. Uh, I mean, there is so much going on there in that subtle interplay. So, I thought maybe it was that dynamic tension that was so interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I try to get a lot of movement and all that sort of stillness. And uh, I do listen to music when I paint, uh, uh, not classical, but there's always music going on. Sometimes if I do something I'm happy with, it might even break out into a little chick. <laughs> <laughs> I see abstract art as decluttering our mind. And right now we need that decluttering. 
because with his computer and the TV and everything, is so much information coming in that we need something to calm. And this is calming for me. Now, do, do you think future generations will be able to respond to like a single image like that? <laughs> right now, I think you know they're too, I mean? right now <laughs> they're too too involved in that. I mean, that's my biggest worry as far as the survival. Of are people going to be able to look at something and see some static? Mm -hmm. um, my question is perhaps most uh, directed to the current abstract painting. Because, so I'm a philosopher and I'm interested in trying to find out what abstraction in painting is. And there's, of course, the Greenbergian historical story that can make sense of some of the older work. Uh, but then, what is it that's going on in abstraction when one does it today? We're making it up. We're, we're figuring out as well, we so, go. But, so, well, if I had the answers, yeah. I, I wouldn't need to make them. I but of course, you can make it. You can sort of read a lot of meaning into those works by thinking of it historically as a development of painting uh, and relating it to the art world of the 1950s. But we're sort of relatively far away from the 1950s now. So, how do you think about your work? Is it? It's not part of that trajectory, as I. It's a dialogue it's, with it. I, I I haven't rejected what's come before. I'm I'm trying to add something to it. Like when you mentioned the concrete artists in Argentina, like you're trying to eliminate all the personal. I'm trying to bring the subjectivity back into something that is usually not associated with that. Um, you know, like I mentioned, you know, like trying to change the reading of the black. Oh, so much black in my painting is to not be. Uh, mournful in any way, and you know, to go against a different kind of emotional uh, response to it. So that's a big part of the, my use of the color. Uh, and that's, as I said, that's very subjective and intuitive. You know, I, I find the color as I'm working on the painting. And for me to decide that it's finished, it's, it's a certain uh, perceptual experience that, you know, that I find. And it's different for each painting, hopefully. So you think that this kind of investigation of color and shape, it's not something that should be could be historically exhausted. It, something more could just continue. Well, it, it, is, it may continue. be for other people, it isn't for me. Uh, but uh, colors have different meaning for everybody. Like you take red and black for a Cuban, that's horrible. <laughs> and that's revolution and whatever. And it's a beautiful combination. So. But is a no no for any Cuban to dress even like that. Yeah, it's, it's an insult. Yeah. And so, also, I mean, also, I think we all see color differently. Uh, you know, there's a little differences in our rods and cones, so we we do perceive color differently. Plus, in addition to all the different things we've seen and experienced, uh, sometimes I think of a color as you know in the yellow ring, and somebody else will see it as green. Uh, I used to not title my paintings, and I refer to them at, by the perimeter color. But I realized that we didn't know what we were talking about with yeah. each other, you know. So then I decided to give, give them a name. Sometimes the title is specific, and sometimes it's just a name, like John or Joe or Jim. I have a comment and a question. I have to thank Patterson Sims for giving me the insight into understanding why I really enjoyed this balanced kind of art in such an unbalanced world. And I'd like to ask Don a question. You have such an exquisite, exquisite balance between your colors and your forms. Don't you have a tremendous urge to want to control the installation of your work? Um, no. You don't? <laughs> you don't? If you want to see what happens when it's yeah. Put up there. What does I I do what I can to like send them out in the world and you know be on the you know it's like sending your kids out there mm -hmm. you know yeah. you can't be there all the time. Uh, I mean aside from doing the, the paintings on styrofoam, I also um, paint uh, like little posters, oil paint on watercolor paper. And I put a stamp on it and put them in the mailbox and send them. And whatever happens to them, you know, someone will find in the mailbox. Um, I tend to send them to people I don't know that well, so it, there's a real element of surprise. Uh, yes, yes, can we all give you your address? <laughs> Some of them get, get through relatively unscathed, and some of them really get laid back 
aspect of your personality. <laughs> I'm from Maine. <laughs> do you, uh, Just a the, Do you ever go to the place where they sell paint, uh, industrial paint, and get the samples from <laughs> and play with them? Um, Have you ever done well, that? I, I, or how do you how do you do your composition? Do you draw the composition or do you how do you? I draw them out as I'm making them on the panel. I don't work from. You don't work from. Uh, you work uh, straight from to the yeah, canvas. Yeah, I make it up as I go. I I might see something and make a little thumbnail sketch and uh -huh. then I figure it out. But generally, I just start pivoting off points, random points that I just select. Um, they worked out on the on the panel as I as I paint them. Uh, the black form may be set and established pretty early on, uh, but everything else is like determined as I as I go. It's it's a response to to the painting. I, I, I think like, like a gesture and an expression is my paint, but you know, to in a in a very different way and very different result. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a comment. As a New Yorker, and I've been next page for about half of my life, there seems to be, and I don't want to mention the art critic's name here, but a sort of New York conceit that the only interaction between Europe and the Americas was New York, when in fact Brazil, Argentina, mm -hmm. Uruguay, and Chile had the same exposure mm -hmm. with Bauhaus, with just after the war, some of the concrete artists from Argentina were in the Bauhaus and that was being reconstructed. So this conceit of the New Yorkers, and I can say this as a New Yorker, is just that, one big conceit. The world is a very complicated place. Well, that's I like so No, no, you're a New Yorker, you're forgiven too. <laughs> you're an artist in the world. <laughs> Any other questions? I just wanted to kind of make a comment about future generations and thinking that this type of work doesn't resonate. Like, I know with Professor Patel's class, I see a lot of interest by the new generation in this type of work. So I think that it will continue to resonate through future generations. Like, I see a lot of interest and activity and involvement in this type of work from my generation. Yeah, there's, there's some young artists in New York who started a, a website. Uh, originally, it was a curatorial web project uh, called Minus Space. And they were about 30 years old and uh, they found an incredible response and it's really grown to the point where they've opened a, you know, an, a, an exhibition space. Um, there's a lot of information on their site and they get like 800 hits a day. You know, they found there was this hunger for information and a community. Uh, What's the name of the site? Minusspace.com, M-I-N-U-S. Yeah. I have a question about the foundations. They seem to be instrumental in setting forth. So fill in a little bit on how these, you know, who runs them, how does the work get to the market. Can you tell us a little bit about the workings of the foundation? Well, there, there are probably 150 of them, and there's a woman named Christine Vincent who was commissioned by uh, the Paula Krasner Foundation gave her some funding, Warhol Foundation I think gave her some funding, and some private individuals did, so she could look into these foundations and learn what she could. So she's created a report, and the report is online, and her name is Christine Vincent, and that's the definitive information. But there are many different ways that these foundations are run, but quite frequently, if the family, if the person had anybody in their family who's alive, that person plays, can play a role, so that Sandy Rower, who's the grandson of, of Alexander Calder. Sandy Rower runs the, 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 um, the, the Calder Foundation, which is a very, very big entity. It owns an enormous amount of work. It has an extraordinary resource. It hasn't been giving donations so much, but it has an idea of creating a Calder Museum, so they're saving some of their resources for that. The Lichtenstein Foundation, again, has enormous resources, and Dr. Lichtenstein, Roy Lichtenstein's widow, is the head of it, though she's hired very intelligently, I think, a man named Jack Coward, who was a curator who liked and really understood Lichtenstein's work very well, to be the president of that. In another case, it's the daughter of the lawyer of that particular artist, Joan Mitchell, who's running the foundation. So she sort of got it as a kind of, I suppose you could say, nepotistically, 
but she's done an amazing job figuring out what its niche can be and what it can do. So there are many different answers to that, but many of these artists also didn't have offspring, didn't have children. They had nieces and nephews. They figured out how to compensate those nieces and nephews so that the corpus of um, the art could be kept together, and in some cases, the money. I have, at the end of her life, I was very friendly with an artist named Hedda Stern, who is, in a way, she should be well known, and many of you know her, because she is in a famous photograph of the Irascibles, who were all the abstract expressions. There's one woman in that photograph, it was taken in 1951, it was Hedda Stern, and she was a very good artist, Hedda, and she was married to an artist who was much better known named Saul Steinberg. Saul and she never divorced. They le he left her in 1960, but he stayed married to her. And so part of his estate went to Hedda, and she died at the age of 100. Well, she has a foundation which had no, virtually no asset because she lived so long that most of the resource was used up. She did own a house that she had sold. Own. The house has now been sold for $7 million. So the foundation went from having a lot of her work and zero financial assets to having about seven, did I say 7,000? I meant to say seven million. Seven million. Seven million. Um, townhouse in New York on East 71st Street. So as a result, you know, we'll see what will happen with that foundation. But she was very interested in women and very concerned about women in a certain way. So it, that might take that direction, it might be supporting causes that would be particularly germane to women. But it's interesting because it's a whole new entity, and it's an entity that they'll stay giving to the arts. Corporations were a huge source of resource for, for the arts for the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s, but they really effectively ceased to be a meaningful support for the arts. I mean, we have the head of development here from, um, from the cross, so he may challenge that, but it's nothing like when I was first working in museums. I mean, museums would get full funding for their exhibitions coming from the philanthropic side of that institute, of that corporation. Now it's all marketing. So we'll give you money, but here's the things that you have to do for that money. You have to park this car in front of the museum. A lot of different things, which are, I suppose, very valid things, but they're not exactly supporting, I and mean, they're not exactly philanthropic. It's, there's definitely an agenda for that giving. So I think these artists' foundations will emerge have emerged and will emerge in the next 15 years. Because there's no way an artist can uh, pass along their art without creating some kind of a, a legal apparatus like a foundation to hold that art. Because it, it isn't feasible in our, with our tax system. Our tax system is ruinous. Are they required to give away the 5% of a private foundation? They are required to do it, but they can do it in a variety of different ways so that it isn't, and they can have very, they can, Kind of shelter what their what what their uh, analyzed financial asset is. It isn't quite as clear to read that sometimes because it could be the property of the artist, it could be the archives of the artist, etc., which might have limited financial value but would have great cultural value. But they they have to apply, and they're they're chartered in a slightly different way um, than some of the other foundations, and they're chartered on a state by state basis. Lots of them are chartered in New York. But many of them are, ch are choosing to charter in other states where they can get greater benefit for what they do. I don't know how many artist foundations there are in, in Florida, but I, well, I would imagine there must be a share. I mean, the Rauschenberg, is, that's been a huge contention in the Rauschenberg Foundation. Is it a, is it a Florida or a New York entity? And clearly, uh, there's some people who are involved in the foundation which would prefer it to be a Florida entity because of income tax issues and because of state tax issues. It would change the situation by tens and tens of millions as to which state. And I think there's maybe even legal action going on right now in the state. Any other questions? We've we got on time. <laughs> We're at 4.57. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>